So do you think the use of simulation in both schools and in hospitals and clinics, pre-hospital, EMS, everywhere, do you think that will help reduce the way we treat patients, number one, and reduce errors? Uh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. And, and, I, and I say that because we just actually concluded a, two short studies. The first one was we went back and we took a random sampling of our 5,400 something learners and, and we looked to see whether they felt that the simulation training had translated well into their clinical practice. And then we looked to see whether or not they had improved competence and confidence as a result of that. And overwhelmingly, uh, in the 90, 95 to 98 percentile, uh, the answer was yes, this, this has made a difference. The, to your previous question, uh, I think it actually goes back to what we're saying. We don't actually know what the errors are because they're not disclosed. I mean, all everything we've talked about here. So you can't actually start to measure something uh, until you have decided you want to measure that particular thing. I will share with you that in my own personal experience, uh, Zach was the medical director for the helicopter service uh, for a while, and uh, I participated in a simulation that he ran, and I had a, a ventilator setting kind of backwards in my mind. I sort of had turned it around somewhere in my training or in my education or just that morning, and I can tell you that it was not shortly thereafter I was picking up a patient uh, that had a very similar uh, presentation of the case that we had worked on. Uh, and I'm confident that had I not had that simulation experience uh, with somebody who knew what they were doing, who could help create an environment for me to not feel threatened, but to be inviting to engage and to think differently. Um, Zach's one of the people that taught me the concept of, you know, adults don't learn by finger wagging. We never have, you know, saying, you know, thou shalt do this. It only sort of sticks as long as we're afraid of whoever's saying thou shalt not do this. It's only when we create an environment where we invite learners to come in and say, we'd like to show you that there's a different way and explain why, and you can choose to engage in that or not. It's up to you. And so for me personally, I, I have that experience of I know that it's prevented error in my own clinical practice. You know, it makes intuitive sense that simulation is set up to address. So what Ben was talking about with his example is something called a latent safety threat. So he did not know that this was a gap in his knowledge. He did not know that this was a potential error waiting to happen. So it makes sense that simulation can address both latent safety threats, which are the unknown unknowns, and active safety threats to patients, which are known unknown, or known knowns. <laughs> Getting all Rumsfeld here for a minute. Um, you know, so I, I do think just to kind of put some technical terms on what he's describing, simulation is definitely well positioned to address those things. And I think that um, in terms of improving the patient outcomes, I think that the active safety threats are the things that we know about these catheter-associated UTIs or CDF transmission or uh, wrong site, wrong med, those are active safety threats. The sneakier ones, and I think the ones that we probably don't, again, have a way to quantify and just exist underneath, uh, you know, underneath the covers until we run a case that exposes them are the latent safety threats, like like Ben was just describing. So, um, you know, I think it, it's not just addressing something that you know to be a problem, but it's mm -hmm. exposing things that you don't know to be problems. Yeah, and Jamie, it's a, it's a good question because if a helicopter crashes, there could be up to four or five fatalities. If a plane crashes, there could be hundreds. And what we're dealing with is one at a time with, as the film said, people who are already sick Mm -hmm. And then each one is it's almost unique, but when in its aggregate there's trends. And then you go back to what um, I heard a number in the audience talk about was they really gravitate to the Swiss cheese model. So there's systems and there's regulation and there's initial training, ongoing training, and simulation and technologies. And you put them all together, hopefully we're going to be moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I agree. I will agree from the educational standpoint, but when I first met Ben and saw the sim truck I, I ran 
straight up and said, we have to have this for our program. And each one of our students that just graduated were the starting point of simulation with, with best practice. And I can say those students absolutely got so much out of that simulation. And now they're mostly, they, they took their boards. So they are now nurses. So, and they are better for it. And so I wanna thank Ben. I want to thank everybody associated with best practice and I want to thank the audience tonight for the questions and hopefully we will be able to post something for the questions that didn't get answered tonight.